All right, good morning. There we go. Go ahead and get started. Sorry about being a little bit late this morning. Sunday school went a little bit late, but we wanted to finish uh, our topic this morning, which was Licensing the Psalms. And so we can start another uh, topic next Sunday morning, beginning in the Sunday school about baptism. And so we'll be teaching about baptism next Sunday in our Sunday school. If you're interested in that, uh, but we're glad that you could be here, glad to have some people back that weren't here over the last few weeks, and uh, look forward to So, um, we will go ahead and begin with the Lord, in, uh, going to the Lord in prayer, and uh, we will get started this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity we have to come to you. The opportunity to recognize that you are our, our God, our Father, our King. Father, help us as we go into your service this morning that we would honor and glorify you today. That we would set aside the cares and trials of this world just for a few moments. And concentrate on you and you alone, for you are worthy to be praised. Father, I help us today, we pray, and these things we ask in your name. Amen. Let us stand and sing, Rejoice, the Lord is King. Rejoice, the Lord is King. Psalm 45 this morning, Psalm 45, my heart is greatly stirred, my heart is greatly stirred.
take your Bibles for our Old Testament reading. Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2. We will stand for the reading of God's Word if you're able. If you don't have a Bible, the words will be on the screen. We'll look at verses 18 through 25 of Genesis chapter 2. We will read this responsibly. I'll, sing, I'll read verse 18. You read verse 19 and so forth and so on. Genesis chapter 2, verses 18 through 25. Let us begin with verse 18. And the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him and help me for him. And out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field, and every fowl of the air, and brought them back to Adam, to see if the world were called him. And so it was Adam called every living creature. That was the name thereof. And Adam gave names to all cattle, and to the fowl of the air, and to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found a help me for him. And the Lord caused the deep to sleep all upon Adam, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs, and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman, and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones, the flesh of my flesh. She shall be called a woman, because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. Thank you. May be seated. May the Lord add a blessing to his word being read this morning. Let us sing, glorious things of thee are spoken, glorious things of thee are spoken. Chapter 5, Hebrews chapter 5. 
a little bit longer than the Genesis passage, but we'll look at, we'll start reading in unison in verse 11. So Hebrews chapter 5, verse 11, we'll stand again for the reading of that God's word. If you're able, again, if you do not have a Bible, the words will be on the screen. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 11, and we're going to chapter 6, verse 12 this morning. So Hebrews chapter 5, verse 11, let us begin there. Of whom we have many things to say, and are to be uttered, seeing ye are dull of hearing. For when, for the time ye ought to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk, and not of strong meat. For every one that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on to perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of the doctrine of baptisms and of laying one of hands and of resurrection of the dead, and of eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permit. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened, and have tasted of the heavenly gift, and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost, and have tasted the good word of God, and the powers of the world to come, if they shall fall away to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh, and put him to an open shame. For the earth which drinketh in the rain that cometh oft upon it, and bringeth forth herbs meet for them by whom it is dressed, receiveth blessings from God. But that which beareth thorns and briars is rejected, and is nigh unto cursing, but whose end is to be burned. But, beloved, we are persuaded better things of you, and things that accompany salvation, though we thus seek. For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love, which ye have shown towards his name, and that ye have ministered to the saints, and do minister. And we desire that every one of you do show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end, that ye be not slothful but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Thank you. you. may be seated. May the Lord add a blessing to his word being read this morning. Is our final hymn before uh, the sermon. Let us sing How Firm a Foundation, How Firm a Foundation.
good singing this morning. If you would take your Bibles, turn to Matthew chapter 21. Matthew chapter 21. We have been dealing now with Jesus and his Passion Week. Jesus has entered into Jerusalem, riding on a colt, full of an ass, as the Bible describes it. The crowds are singing, Hosanna, 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 the Lord, Son of David. He goes into the temple. He overthrows the tables of money changers. He disperses the doves. He, he casts out the lambs and the sheep. The children are crying again, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna to the Lord in the temple. Chief priests are upset not with the money changers. They're upset with the children understanding who God is in the flesh of Jesus Christ. The children, the blind, the blind people, and the lame know who Jesus is, recognize who Jesus is, and comes to Jesus. And Jesus, in his judgment, is showing compassion. And the next morning he goes and he comes back to the city. He casts a curse on the fig tree. It's the only time he uses his miracle power to curse a living creature, a living, living creation, as an illustration of the nation of Israel's lack of faith. And in so doing, as and so doing that illustration, he comes to the disciples and he uh, challenges them their faith that they do not doubt. And we come to the temple today, and we've been dealing with, uh, as we've titled, the King's Authority over the last couple of weeks. When we see the King's Authority as he comes into the temple, as he comes in riding on the cult of full of an ass. We see his authority in the temple. We see his authority by casting the curse on the fig tree. We see his authority even in healing the blind, lame children, and the blind and the lame in the temple. But this morning we come to our passage and his authority is questioned. His authority is questioned. We look, the title of the message is this morning the king's authority question. And I dare say that this is not just relegated to the passage we have this morning. And I would dare say that authority problems afflict most of us. Now, remember, the disciples were prone to ask Matthew 18, 1, who's the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? That they wanted authority. Uh, Matthew 20, 20 through 28 James and John decide to send their mother on behalf of them and ask if James and John can sit on the left hand and the right hand of Jesus when his kingdom comes. Again, they want authority. The desire to be in charge, to have authority, is common. I hear my children sometimes say, I can't wait to grow up so I can make my own decisions. <laughs> But in our desire for authority, selfishness often leads us astray. Because we often want authority, do we not, when it isn't ours to be had. We often want to seize authority when it isn't ours. Because we are selfish and prideful, we want to make our decisions. We want to make the decisions. And for us as Christians this morning, and as we'll get into this this morning, we struggle with authority in our life because we think we know better than God. It's illustrated for us here this morning with the Jewish leaders. Think with me for a moment. The Jewish leaders want authority. They wanted to kill Jesus because they, Jesus threatened their authority. The Romans also viewed Jesus as a threat because they 
They ended up having the power to kill Jesus, and they ultimately did. But in a weird way, popularity gave Jesus the kind of power in which the leaders of Israel wanted. And yet, some of the Israelites outside of the, uh, the religious cabal there in Jerusalem wanted Jesus to use this newfound power based on the popularity of the crowds in which we've just seen in Matthew chapter 21 to overthrow the Roman government, to set up his kingdom, to rule and reign for Israel. But the problem is, is Jesus' authority did not come from what we would consider populism today. And Jesus' authority came from God. John chapter 1 says he is the word, and the word dwelt among us. The very word that was used to create the heavens and the earth in Genesis chapter 1 is found in Matthew chapter 21, and who the religious leaders are questioning is authority. As we've known from some time, the Jewish Jesus has been in conflict with these leaders. Uh, they have continued to bring direct charges against his teaching, against his ministry, against his actions. None of that has worked so far, it said. Uh, they step back for a few weeks, as we have seen, and they're going to try a new tactic this morning. Since they have been unable to successfully rebuke Jesus and his teachings and his actions, they're going to question his authority. They're going to take an indirect approach to question the authority by which he does these things. Uh, look at the... Uh, the questioning of his authority in Matthew chapter 21, 23 through 27. And when he was come into the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came unto him as he was teaching and said, By what authority doest thou these things? And who gave thee this authority? And Jesus answered and said to them, I, will, I also will ask you one thing, which if ye tell me, I am likewise will tell you by what authority I do these things. The baptism of John, whence was it? From heaven or of men? It was very shrewd on Jesus' part. And we'll get into the whys. And they reasoned with themselves, saying, If we shall say from heaven, he will say unto us, Why did ye not then believe him? But if we shall say of men, we fear the people, for all had John, for all hold John as a prophet. They're no more politicians at this point if they're concerning, they're concerning themselves with the polls of the people. And they answered Jesus and said, We cannot tell. And he said unto them, Neither tell I you by what authority I do these things. Again, the title of the message is The King's Authority Question. The King's Authority Question. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Father, as we come to your word this morning, Father, we pray as we think about this question. As we think about your authority this morning, that you would allow us to think and meditate on this question, uh, press home upon our hearts the importance of answering this question correctly. While we ask that you would open our eyes this morning, allow the Spirit to illuminate the Scriptures so that we may understand Listen, hear, and then obey the scriptures this morning. Father, help us today. These things we ask in your son's name. Amen. Uh, we have asked the question over the last couple of weeks, who is Jesus? Right? Well, something that we all as individuals have to answer ourselves. Because as we have looked at over the last several weeks, how does the crowds go from chanting Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna on a Monday and saying crucify, crucify him on a Friday. Because they answered this question about who is Jesus, not as the Bible would consider who Jesus is, but as what they thought Jesus is. And as we come to a different question this morning, this is of utmost importance to us as believers and even as unbelievers. Because we must ask the question, along with the, the scribes and the Pharisees this morning, who is Jesus, and what is the source of his authority?
The, the outline of the message this morning will be a question and then two responses. And so you have a question and two responses. So the question is then, who gave you this authority? Verse 23. As you look there in verse 23, and when he had come into the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came unto him as he was teaching and said, By what authority doest thou these things, and who gave thee this authority? These people are challenging Christ's authority by which he teaches. And by this challenge, we are then asked ourselves this morning, what authority does the Christ have in our life today? Because our response to Jesus' authority in our life is actually a good spiritual test to find out where we are in our Christian life. That is, as one author says, a good indicator of where our heart is with God. And let's think about this as we move through this. How is our heart in response to Jesus' authority today? Jesus is, is coming now and he's being questioned by the scribes and Pharisees and the elders and the chief priests. All these representatives of the Sanhedrin now are gathered here in Jerusalem. And they put this question to Jesus in order to trap Jesus. They're wanting to embarrass him, take away his, uh, the popularity authority which the crowds have given him. And they want to basically thwart his ministry, shame him by questioning his authority. They could be saying, well, you're not seminary trained, so you shouldn't be having this authority. Uh, they could also be saying, well, you grew up as a carpenter's son. How do you dare have this authority? But in all actuality, they are coming to him, and how dare he make the claims that he's making with the authority which he's making them? Because in order for you to make some of the claims that Jesus is making, he would actually, as most people do today in writing books, they would have footnotes or endnotes sorting, uh, citing the sources of which their authority comes from as they write a book. But Jesus is not citing any sources because he is the source. He is the authority. And so they're wondering, why, how does he have this authority if he's not citing anyone to give him his authority? They are not just, and we'll, if you look to Mark and Luke especially, they're not just upset by what he has done in the temple by overthrowing the money changers, allowing the children to sing his praises. They're upset with his teaching as well. I mean, what authority does Jesus have to ride into Jerusalem on a donkey? What authority does Jesus have to overthrow the money changers? What authority does Jesus have to allow the children to praise him as if he is the Son of God? What authority does Jesus have as if he is healing the blind and the lame? What authority does Jesus have as he curses the fig tree? And you can go on and on and on and back through the first 20 chapters of Matthew. By what authority does Jesus do these things? But they're after Jesus' teaching. How dare a son of a carpenter come in and teach this way, having no authority? But the question is, is that we've read through Matthew, as we've studied Matthew, as we've preached on Matthew. There is no question to Jesus' authority, is there? I mean, you could go uh, back to John the Baptist. And we'll look at this later, but John the Baptist says, Behold, the Lamb of God which taketh away the sins of the world. You can go to the Sermon on the Mount, and the Pharisees are questioning by the authority by which he preaches the different aspects of the law. They are amazed continually, the crowds are amazed continually at the end of chapter 7 by the authority by which he teaches. They're amazed by the end of chapter 9, by the, the authority, by the miracles in which he does. At time and time again throughout the book of Matthew, Matthew is allowing us into the hearts of people, and they are amazed by his authority. 
whether it's his teaching, his claims, his miracles, his life. No, we've seen in several instances his enemies declare that he is the Son of God. We've seen the demons declare that he's the Son of God. The question that they've asked Jesus has already been answered. But this isn't a question of, of wanting an answer. This is a question trying to shame and guilt Jesus, trying to uh, disprove his authority. It's not that Jesus has not made it clear who he is. He has. It's that the Sanhedrin is prideful. They're not willing to see all the indicators that Jesus is the Son of God. Let's, let's bring this home for us for a moment. We would acknowledge today that Christ has authority in our lives, do we not? We can, we can say that, and we would have good biblical evidence that if we are believers, if we are children of God, that Christ has authority in our lives. I, I think we would all agree on that this morning, and I would hope those who are watching my Facebook would agree with us as well. Because not understanding Christ's authority... Or not saying, well, I don't have enough information to make a decision about Christ and his authority. It's not that we haven't been given enough information. It's the fact that we are in rebellion against God. Time and time again throughout Scripture, especially in the last 20 chapters, we have seen the testimony of people. We have seen the testimony of demons. We have seen the testimony of the disciples that this truly is the Son of God. But how we respond to Jesus Christ, even after our salvation, shows us what kind of Christian we are. And for those of us, if we are unsaved today, we have to make the decision of who Jesus is. If he is the Son of God, and if I trust him to forgive me of my sins, and that he died on the cross for my sins, and he took God's wrath as payment for my sin, and that he rose again the third day, and if I believe these things, yes... Jesus is going to have authority in your life. But now that we are Christians, we have to make the decision every day then that Jesus has authority in our life. If we claim to be Christians this morning and we reject the authority of Jesus Christ, then there is something terribly wrong with us this morning. Because I'm sure we have heard, maybe we have even said this before. As Christians, I know what the Bible says, but. Right? If we haven't said it, we've probably heard someone say, I know what the Bible says, but. But what are they doing right there? They are questioning Jesus' authority in their life. You can hear Christians today say, I know what the Bible says, uh, but that was in the first century. This is the 21st century, and we're smarter and better than they are. And so we try to manipulate the, and use the culture to help us determine what the Bible says, but yet, in so doing, we are questioning Jesus' authority in our life. And we are questioning the Scripture's authority in our life. Sometimes we may be uh, sitting in our own room or the couch or in the morning as we read, and, and the Bible speaks to us, and there's particular sin that keeps popping up in our life. And the Bible continually pricks our heart, and, we, and it wants us to do something, make a decision about that. And we may say in our minds, I know what the Bible says, I know what I'm supposed to do, but. If we, based on our actions, 
question the authority of Scripture, the authority of God's Word, the authority of Jesus Christ today, then we are standing with the chief priests and elders and scribes of the Sanhedrin. We are essentially saying, Jesus, by what authority do you have to do that in my life? We may say, who gave you that authority to tell me what to do? And Matthew Henry says, to acknowledge that a doctrine is from God and yet not receive and entertain it is the greatest absurdity and iniquity that a man can be charged with. You think about it. We know what the scripture says about a whole host of things. And what we're supposed to do, what we're not supposed to do. And yet if we as a child of God says, Lord, I know what you say, but... That is the height of arrogancy. Is it not? I mean, we may not say, we may not get up, and you may not, you may be thinking to yourself, well, this is ridiculous. And you may not say in the middle of church, stand up and say, I don't believe in the sovereignty of God. I don't believe that Jesus has authority in my life. We may all agree and say we do agree with all of that, but our attitudes may show us different. Our struggle is not with what we intellectually ascend to. In that we say Jesus is the King of kings and Lord of lords. But if we would watch your life or my life, does our actions line up with what we believe? What I dare say today, this morning, is that our actions actually tell us what you really believe about Jesus' authority. Our actions would say, I believe that Jesus has authority in this area, in this area, in this area, but not this and this. I mean, think about it this way. All of us, majority of us, have been teenagers at one point in our life. Our, our parents tell us to do something. And, and our immediate reaction is, they don't know. They're not living my life. They don't know what's going on. They haven't lived this time period. They don't know what it's like growing up now in the 21st century. And we, our parents tell us to do a certain thing here and do a certain thing here. And they have responsibility over our lives. But as they begin to try to help us grow as adults and they try to help us live a life as a Christian, we begin to bristle at the notion that they have authority in our life. By the way, it's a God-given authority in our life. I mean, you can see this time and time again as, as Christians uh, in different relationships. They are involved in relationships that they have no business being involved in. I, I believe that Jesus has authority in my life except this area. Uh, we may say uh, to our kids... We don't want you hanging out with this person because they're a bad influence. They may not say it out loud, but they're actually saying, you can't tell me what to do. Those illustrations, the, the teenager is not going to say, I don't respect my parents' authority, but their actions say otherwise. Because this is a struggle for all of us, is it not? That Jesus makes certain demands upon our lives, and we have to say yes or no. 
And the struggle is with the authority in our life. Because we're selfish and prideful. And sometimes we don't want to give up the control that is necessary for Jesus to have in our life. Oh, we have routinely said, right, that, that Matthew, he brings up a theme in his, in his gospel, and he continually re- brings that theme back and back and back again. At the Sermon on the Mount, the question of authority, right, he comes back here in Matthew chapter 1, but if you were to turn in your Bible to Matthew chapter 6, right, verse 24, no, no man can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and man. What is Jesus saying now in Matthew chapter 21? What are the chief priests saying to Jesus? Essentially, if Christ is not the Lord of your life, then you are the Lord of your life. And if, and if we continue to struggle with the Lordship of Jesus in our life, and the Lordship of us in our life, it's going to be a constant struggle. And we may give Jesus a little here, but we're going to take somewhere else to make sure that it balances. The problem is, is we can't serve two masters. We cannot serve self and the Savior. I would dare say this morning that there are many things in our lives, I'll say some things in our lives, that we know that we're supposed to be doing, but we are not. And there are things that we shouldn't be doing, but we are. And by doing and not doing those things, we are questioning the authority. We stand with the scribes and the elders and the Pharisees, the chief priests of the Sanhedrin, and say, by what authority do you have Jesus on my life? And then the question comes down, if there is such a struggle... With the authority of Jesus Christ in our life. What does first John say? John hears Jesus' teaching, is there listening, there. He's even struggling with the authority of Jesus in his own life. Remember, he's the one who asked, who's the greatest in the kingdom. He's the one that sends his mother to ask those questions about him and his brother. But what does John write in his epistle in 1 John 2, 3? And hereby do we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. We can say, I believe that God is sovereign over everything, including my life. But the practical outward expression of that is to say, I'm going to obey your commandments. And Jesus makes it very plain, does he not, throughout his entire earthly ministry, that he is who he says he is. He is the Son of God. And the only way we can come to the Son of God is through humble heart. Trust and faith in who he is. There is no place in this life where we can have it both ways. But we can't say, well, Jesus, you're a good teacher, but I'm going to live my life. Well, we can't have it both ways where Jesus, yes, I, I agree with you, the Son of God, but you can't have these areas of my life. To Jesus, it's all or nothing proposition. There's a lot of people even in churches that say, well, Jesus is good, and that's good for you, but here in my life, I'm going to do it this way. But 
But Jesus often tells us in Scripture, especially the Sermon on the Mount, there are only two people in this world, those who believe and those who don't believe. Those who accept his claims and those who do not accept his claims. We, we can't straddle the fence on this. The question for us today, the question that chief elders and scribes and great priests ask Jesus is, by what authority? And we must ask that question to our own self. What authority does Jesus have in your life? In my life? Jesus responds to the question, verses 24 and 25, and Jesus answered and said to them, I will ask you one thing, which if ye tell me, I and likewise will tell you by what authority I do these things. He asked the question. This is a typical uh, first century teaching thing. Uh, somebody would come to the teacher, ask the question, and the teacher would turn around and ask another question to help illustrate or help uh, move the conversation and move the teaching experience. The baptism of John, whence was it? From heaven or of men? It's very interesting. Jesus doesn't say, believe me, I'm, I'm an authority. And Jesus doesn't say, as sometimes we as parents say to our children, because I said so. No, he asked a question. He answers their question with a question. Jesus isn't skirting the issue here. Jesus isn't using a rhetorical device to have us stop and think and ponder and meditate on, which it is. It's impossible to acknowledge that John was a servant of God without acknowledging that Jesus himself was Lord, right? If they answer in the affirmative that John's authority came from heaven, then John says in Matthew 3 that Jesus is greater than he is. And... For those who have the eye of discernment here at this question, for those who are not uh, hard-hearted enough to not listen to the question and answer it for themselves, they understand what Jesus is doing. Jesus is linking his authority to John the Baptist. Matthew likens John the Baptist to a type of prophet, right? An Old Testament prophet, Matthew chapter 3. Verses 1 through 4, Matthew, even in that passage of Scripture, takes the Old Testament Isaiah, prophet Isaiah, to confirm to us that John the Baptist is a prophet. 1 through 4, Matthew chapter 3. In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. But this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. And the same John had his raiment of camel's hair and a leaven girdle about his loins, and his meat was locust and wild honey. Even all the way back to Matthew 3, there is a link between Matt, uh, Jesus and John. You can even see the stronger link in Luke, right? In Luke chapter 1. John even predicted that someone stronger than he is his coming. Matthew chapter 3, verses 11 and 12. Jesus doesn't say, because I'm God, that's why I have my authority. Because I'm the Son of God, that's why I have my authority. No, he, he links his authority back to John. And Jesus is, is so confident in his calling from God that he doesn't have to say, I'm from God. Because he knows where his authority comes from, and he knows that God called him to do this ministry in this lifetime. Think about David, for instance. We all know that David was anointed king of Israel when he was a young boy, right? He was so confident that he did not lay a hand on the Lord's anointed, right? He waited to Saul to pass away before he became king of Israel. 
Why? Because he was so confident that God had called him to be the king of Israel. Matthew Henry says, it's good for all who take upon themselves to act with authority to put this question to themselves. Who gave me this authority? For unless a man is clear in his own conscience concerning that, he cannot act with any comfort of hope or success. Jesus knew his commission. Jesus knew his calling. And he was utterly confident in it. So he doesn't have to say, I am the son of God. He just says, look at John. If you can answer where John's authority came from, and you know where my authority comes from. Jesus has answered their question in a roundabout way by asking another question. And now he puts the chief priests and scribes in a conundrum. If the answer from heaven, then he could say, well, then why haven't you accepted me if you accepted John's ministry? Well, if you say he's not from God, then the people will turn on them because the people thought he was a prophet. There's, we don't have a third way to deal with the authority of Jesus Christ in our life. Uh, we like to try to manufacture a third way. We, we, we try to explain ourselves, and we, we try to make excuses for ourselves, but we either accept it or we don't. The same way with the gospel, you either accept it or you don't. But we being men and women born into sin have a sin nature and oftentimes we find ourselves full of pride and arrogance saying that I know better than Jesus. And yet if we come to Jesus with humbled knee in our salvation, should we not come to him every day and humbled knee? And say, yes, Lord. Forgive me, Lord. The leaders respond to Jesus in verses 25 and 27. And they reasoned with themselves, saying, If we shall say from heaven, he will say unto us, Why did ye not then believe him? And this is off the point this morning. But Matthew does this routinely where he lets us know by way of just allowing us into conversations that Jesus had no part of, showing us that he is the he is God by way of deity. He knows all things, even conversations that Jesus was not a part of. But if we shall say of men, we fear the people for all hold John as a prophet. And they answered Jesus and said, we cannot tell. And he said unto them, neither tell I you by what authority I do these things. I mean, it's amazing. They, and they think they have Jesus right where they want him. By what authority do you do these things? And Jesus answers with a question, and now they're, they're stumbling. Uh, they're off in a corner trying to connive their way out of this. They're frightened. How do we get ourselves out of this mess now that we've put ourselves in? Jesus had put to them a question that they did not want to answer. I mean, they could have been honest and said, we don't want to answer the question. Right? They could have been honest and said, uh, I don't want to answer that question. Oh, we don't know the answer to that question. But as any good politician, they skirt the issue and walk away. Because they look at the polls and say, the polls, the people are saying this, and so we shouldn't want to go against the people. The very irony is, is the very people questioning the authority of Jesus Christ are actually held captive by the authority of the people. They have no authority whatsoever now in this instance because they're afraid of what Jesus is going to say. 
and they're afraid of what the people might say. The very people who want authority, who think they have authority, have no authority whatsoever. Because they are beholden by people's opinions about them. These people have seen the miracles. These people have heard the teachings. These people have seen the actions by what Jesus Christ has done. And they refuse to recognize the authority by which God has given Jesus. The thing is, is, is when we come to Christ, we don't get to negotiate the terms by which we come. We don't get to say to all right, God, I'll be your child if I can do A, B, and C. And then you negotiate and you go back. There is no negotiating with God. But we come to God by his terms and on his time. And we come, every one of us, come to Christ on bended knee and humble hearts, acknowledging who God is and what Christ has done for us. By in so doing, we also acknowledge his authority in our life, and he has authority to say and do whatever he wants with our life. May God help us today to not only assent to say that Jesus is the Lord of my life, but practically live that out. If not, we're no different than the chief scribes and Pharisees in Matthew 24. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for this interaction between your son and scribes and Pharisees. Father, the, the question by what authority is a researching and probing question and even in our, into our own, our own hearts. Do we allow you to have authority in our lives? Or are there certain areas of our life that are off limits? Father, help us. Forgive us. Father, allow your Holy Spirit to work in our hearts this morning. These things we ask in your Son's name. Amen. Let us stand and sing for our final hymn this morning. Trust and obey. Trust and obey.
mentioned this morning. Lots of things to think about. What authority does Jesus have in our life? Have we given him all? Or do we just have given him partial? Jesus has laid claim in all of our lives that he is the Lord and Savior of our life. How dare we, in our ignorance and our arrogance, keep that from him? Dennis, would you close us in prayer? Heavenly Father, we thank you for your precious word. We thank you for this time. And we thank you for your words that have said pretty plain that we are to trust and obey. We're really born again believers, Father. Only we can know what's in our hearts. And if we search our hearts and we're willing to trust and obey, that means everything. Um, there's no certain way other than that. Trust and obey. We either trust God, trust Christ, the true Son of God, and obey Him. If we do not do that, we will have no victory and there is no salvation. Father, let us all, always remember that if we true born again believers, we must trust and obey Christ in everything and to be open with Him in everything for us to have a life that honors Him. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.